Chapter 5 Japan and Korea. Let's begin with the Shinto religion. Shinto is all about the devotion to spiritual beings called kami, their nature spirits. They are concerned about human beings. They appreciate our interest in them and want us to be happy. There are rituals that people perform that enable the humans to communicate with the kami. The kami are not quite gods. Shintoism is a very local religion. People tend to be devoted to their local shrine rather than a religion as a whole. Oftentimes, Japanese will have tiny shrine altars in their homes. In fact, Japanese usually don't consider Shinto as a religion as such. It's just an aspect of Japanese life. Shinto was a popular form of religion or uh, religious observance before Buddhism entered the country. The name Shinto comes from the Chinese characters for Shen, or divine being, and Tao, or the way, means way of the spirits. Visiting the Shinto shrines at New Year is a very popular event in Japan. Because Shinto is focused on the land of Japan, it is very much an ethnic religion and not practiced often outside of Japan. Shinto sees human beings as basically good and has no concept of original sin. There's no canonical scriptures, no commandments, but it does teach important ethical principles. There's no founder and no overriding god. Shinto does not require the adherents to follow it as their only religion. So someone can be a Buddhist and also follow Shinto at the same time. There are about 2.7 million adherents to Shintoism in the world. In Canvas, you will see some videos on the Otomatsuri Fire Festival in Shingu. The Otomatsuri is a fire festival held every year on February 6th. Men of all ages dress in white clothes with thick straw rope wrapped around their waist. There are about 2,000 of these men called Noboriko, and they're holding torches with a sacred fire in prayer for a good harvest and family safety. So the video shows that these men with these torches as they run down from the shrine. So you see these flames coming down almost like a waterfall or a dragon. On the day of the festival, women are prohibited from the Kamakura Jinja shrine grounds, but are able to watch the festivities from the path leading to the shrine. Esoteric Buddhism Esoteric Buddhism represents the teachings of the Buddha that are only available to those who have received proper initiation from a true Vajira master. While anyone can view the text, they're only able to be fully understood through direct experience and training under the guidance of a qualified master. Exoteric refers to knowledge that is outside and independent from a person's experience and can be ascertained by anyone. Shakyamuni Buddha transmitted these secret teachings to his son Rahula and the Shambhala king Sushandra. He continued to transmit them after his death to adepts who were able to receive them. It includes five divisions of esoteric practice, mantras, mudras, remember those hand positions, visualizations, mandalas, and the inner and outer tantra initiation or empowerment. Other names are, in the Chinese it is often called Jinyan Shong, while the Japanese form is called Shingon, the Tibetan form of esoteric Buddhism offers the highest forms of practice. Jodo is the Japanese name for pure land Buddhism, which we talked about in the previous chapter on China. Zen is a practice that was transmitted from master to disciple and goes back to the awakening of Siddhartha Gautama or Shakyamuni Gautama in Japanese. It's a school of Buddhism that originated in China during the Tang Dynasty known as Chan Buddhism. Zen Buddhism is strongly influenced by Taoism. From China, Chan Buddhism spread south to Vietnam, northeast to Korea, and east to Japan, where it became known as Zen Buddhism. 
Zen emphasizes rigorous self-control and meditation. It de-emphasizes just knowledge of sutras and doctrine and favors direct understanding through interactions with teachers and others. There's an emphasis on self-denial and self-discipline, austerity, simplicity, intuitive thought, and appreciation of beauty in nature. Here's the area we will be talking about in this chapter, Japan and Korea. Here is the Hanawa figure of a warrior from the Kufun period. Hanawa is a clay circle. These are hollow terracotta cylinders supporting models of shields, singers, warriors, ladies, fish, birds, houses, and even horses. They mark the boundary between the land of the living and the land of the dead. These are funerary objects placed on top of mounded tombs, typically lined along the outermost perimeter of a tomb. So here we see this warrior, and we see this bottom area is the round circular area that can then be uh, punched into the ground. Here are some other warriors. Gives you an idea of their different styles. And here's one of the horses. So you actually can punch all four of the legs into the ground so it'll stay. That's a great horse there. And there is a elaborate shrine. Here are some other figures. And now the grand shrine. Shintoism tries to preserve the traditional values of early rural and agrarian Japan. Oftentimes it is combined with Taoism and Confucianism. At I see women from the imperial family serve as high priestesses here at Ise. The original shrine held a sacred mirror of Amaterasu no Amakami, the sun goddess and ancestor of Japanese emperors. Together with the sword and jewel that the goddess gave Emperor Niniji no Mikoto, the mirror became part of the official Japanese imperial regalia. Under Sunin, the 11th emperor, the mirror was enshrined at Ise, one of Japan's two major imperial shrines. Every 20 years since 600 AD, the building has been dismantled and replaced by a new one and rededicated in the presence of the imperial family. Every log is chosen for their ideal proportions. They are cut in spring and then allowed to rest so sap dries up, and the kami are able to find new homes. They are then rubbed with an red-orange persimmon juice. These are joined with a mortise and tenon joints. There are no nails or bolts in the entire building. It is a smoked thatch roof. There are wooden weights along the ridge pole and diagonal cross pieces extending from gables. It was last rebuilt in 2013. So this entire structure is rebuilt every 20 years. Can you imagine the amount of time and money it takes to do this? But it is considered to be part of the sacred act to create this shrine. Here are some other images of it. You can see that very thick thatched roof and the cross pieces that are extending out from the gables here. Again, they were originally had a function. They're more decorative at this point. Now let's go to Korea. This is Maitreya. This is a bodhisattva, or the Buddha of the future. The idea is this is a bodhisattva who would come to earth to bring enlightenment to everyone. This bodhisattva is deeply absorbed in meditation, hence the pensive gesture. So according to Buddha's tradition, Maitreya is a bodhisattva who will appear on earth in the future to help achieve complete enlightenment and teach the pure dharma. Maitreya will be a successor to the present Buddha, Gautama Buddha. Maitreya is typically pictured seated with either both feet on the ground or crossed, as you see here, on a throne waiting for his time. He is typically dressed in the clothes of an Indian royalty. He wears a small stupa in his headdress. You can see right here in his headdress. This represents the stupa with the relics of Gautama Buddha, 
to help him identify it when his turn comes to lay claim to his succession. Sometimes he's holding a Dharma Chakra, Wheel of Dharma, resting on a lotus. He typically has a kata, or traditional scarf, tied around his waist. Here are some other Maitreya Buddhas as well. This is the Hakuho period. Let's talk about Hoyuji, means temple. This was founded by Prince Shotoku Tashi in 607. Most of the architects and artists working on this were Korean. At the center is a pagoda. A pagoda is a tiered tower with multiple eaves. It is built in traditions originating like the stupa. Most pagodas were built of a religious function. Pagodas were often connected to Buddhist religious ideas and were often located near viharas or Buddhist monasteries. These actually probably derive from the Han watchtowers or stupas of Gandhara. Pagodas are venerated from the outside just like a stupa. You can enter the Kondo or Golden Hall. They are reliquaries that hold sacred relics and symbolize the pathway uniting terrestrial and supernatural worlds. The Hoyuji Pagoda has four tableaux on the ground floor and there is no access to the upper sections. Pilgrims walk in a clockwise direction around the building. An intricate system of flexible interlocking brackets allows the wooden supports under the roof to expand and contract with changes in the weather as they transfer the weight of the wide, upturned, tiled roofs onto the thin, engaged posts below. So here are some other pagodas that we can kind of look at. So the pagoda, again, a, a multi-tier tower. And again, it's not something that it's really meant to be used in these upper sections. These are representational. And then we have that top section, again, very much like the stupas that we talked about earlier. And here are a couple diagrams just to kind of give you an idea of the meanings and influence and, and how these are put together. So these kind of show the way these are. All right, and so I thought this was an excellent diagram showing, again, early stupas and then later stupas and how those later stupas connect to these pagodas. So we've got the early stupa, like we talked about uh, earlier in the last chapter, and then how those stupas kind of uh, changed into this version. And now we look at the wooden pagoda and we can see the similarities. So I thought this was a good visual aid for that. This is the Tamamushi Shrine. This is a wooden replica of a 7th century uh, kondo in the uh, Hoyoji treasure house, most likely Korean made. It is made out of cypress and camphor wood. There's a roofed gable over a truncated hip roof with broad flaring eaves supported by long bracket arms. The crescent-shaped decorations over the ends of the ridgepole may be dolphins. These right here. Standing on the front doors of this miniature building are two of the four guardian kings that are clad in armor. They're holding slender halberds and their heads are ringed with a basically a Buddhist halo. On the side doors are bodhisattvas standing on lotus pedestals. Their heads crowned with three mani jewels holding a flowering lotus stalk in one hand and forming a mudra or gesture with the other. The mudra is a form of the wheel of law gesture that we've talked about previously. Just a little closer view so you can still see some of these a little bit better. Here are two of the four kings I talked about, the four guardian kings. There you can see them. They've got the halos, they've got the armor and the flowing robes. Here are the bodhisattvas standing on their lotus pedestals, again that we talked about. And this is actually close up of the back panel. It is a sacred landscape with four caves. Buddhist monks are seated in them. Either side of the central mountain is a phoenix and an apsara or celestial being riding on clouds. So we can see the celestial beings up here riding on the clouds. 
and we see the monks there uh, sitting in their caves and at the very top we see the sun and the moon so we have that sun and the moon right there at the very top this may actually be a representation of mount woju where shaka preached the lotus sutra on the front are two kneeling monks you see here holding censers i remember those hold incense and we have a vessel here in the center also burning incense. We have the incense being burned here, and we have the censers that they're holding there, and then the two kneeling monks there. Below are Buddhist relics. The vessel at the bottom is flanked by lions. They're a little hard to tell, but you've got a lion on either side here. On the back is another sacred landscape. The central mountain is topped by a palace, and supporting a pair of small palaces on either side. At the foot is a dragon, and beneath it a palace with a seated figure. In the side zones are phoenix, celestial beings, jewels, the sun, and the moon. This sacred landscape represents Mount Sumeru, the central world mountain. The bottom represents the seas. So again, we've got some of the, the palaces. We've got, again, the um, sun and the moon up here. We've got the dragon here at the central area. And on the right panel is a scene uh, from the Nirvana Sutra. So at the bottom, the Buddha is undergoing aesthetic training in the mountains. And Indira, on the right, appears before him in the guise of a demon. Upon hearing half a verse of the scriptures the buddha offered to cast away his body to the flesh-eating demon for the remainder before doing so in the middle tier of the painting the buddha inscribes the teachings on the rocks he then casts himself down from the summit where he is caught mid plummet by indra on the right in his true guise so we've got we've got the buddha and we've got uh, and there, as the uh, demon at the bottom, and then uh, he's inscribing, the Buddha's inscribing his teachings on the rocks. And then he, this one right here is this top is where he is falling from the top of this mountain. And then we see right here uh, that Indira comes out, his true guy is to uh, save him. And now lastly, this is the left panel of the plinths, the so-called Tiger Taka. It's an episode from the Golden Light Sutra. We have a bodhisattva removing his upper garments and hanging them on a tree before casting himself from a cliff to feed a hungry tigress and her cubs down below. So we've got the bodhisattva here hanging his garments and then falling here to the tigress and her cubs down below. Now let's talk about the Nara period. This is the Daibutsuden Kondo of the Todaji complex. The Todaji and the Daibutsuden of the Great Buddha Hall in Nara, Japan, also encompasses a gigantic bronze Buddha. The building itself was once the world's largest wooden building. It was surpassed in 1998 by a Japanese stadium. This was completed in 759. It was, again, the largest wooden building ever. At the time, it was the largest building project ever on Japanese soil. It was rebuilt in the 12th century. Mahayana Buddhism was officially introduced to the Japanese imperial court around 552 by an emissary from a Korean king. He offered the Japanese emperor Kamei a gilded bronze statue of the Buddha and a copy of the Buddha Sutras. Toroji is the chief temple of the Kokubinji system and the center of national ritual. Its construction brought together the best craftspeople in all of Japan with the latest building technology. However, every person in Japan was required to contribute to this through a special tax. So many people were very critical of this. A court chronicler wrote, the people are made to suffer by the construction of Toroji and the clans worry over their suffering. 
At the heart of this building is a massive handul, or main hall. It's also called a daibutsun, or Great Buddha Hall. It was completed in 1750s and measured 164 feet by 282 feet by 157 feet. It was supported by 84 massive cypress pillars and holds a huge bronze Buddha that in itself is 49 feet high. So here is the Buddha we're talking about. It was commissioned by Emperor Shomu in 743. This Buddha required all the available copper in Japan, and workers used an estimated 163,000 cubic feet of charcoal to produce the metal alloy and form the bronze figure. The snail curl hair, one of the 32 signs of the Buddha's divinity, took an additional two years to create. It weighs 380 tons. It is the largest copper statue of Buddha in the world. During the Zhenpei Civil War, countless temples were destroyed as Buddhist clergy took sides in clan warfare. This temple was burned by the Tiara clan in 1180. At the war's end, the reconstruction of Todoiji was one of the first projects undertaken by Minamoto Yoritomo, who was the new ruling shogun. The aristocracy and the warrior elite contributed funds, and the Buddhist priest Shanjobo Chojin was placed in charge of reconstruction. Going back to the Buddha that you see here, again, he's 49 feet tall. His face alone is 17 and a half feet long, and his hair, remember the snail curl hair? There's actually 966 individual bronze balls of that hair. And I thought this was a great image to show really the size and scale. These are two workers who are cleaning the Buddha. And here it is from the front. Here is a scale model of the whole building complex to give you an idea. Now we're in the Heian period. This is Red Fudo. Fudo, the immovable, is seated on a rock before a wall of flames and holds a dragon sword symbolizing lightning. He typically has fangs that you see there. He is the immovable wisdom king. He is the guardian of Buddhism, one of the five wisdom kings, and he has a very scary appearance because he's meant to frighten people into accepting salvation. He converts anger into compassion and cuts the ties and negative feelings and demons to liberate us from suffering through self-control. He also battles evil with his immovable faith and his compassion. He is the guide for deceased souls, and he presides over a funeral ceremony held on the 11th day after his death. All right, so we see this, this sword. There's this sword right here. The uh, Sword of Wisdom, of which he cuts through deluded and ignorant minds. And then on the other hand, he is the rope. And that is the rope that he binds those who are ruled by their violent passions and emotions. And leads them on to the correct path of self-control. He himself is surrounded by flames, as you can see. These consume the evil and the defilements of the world. He sits on a flat rock, that you see right here, which symbolizes the unshakable peace and the bliss which he bestows to the minds and bodies of his devotees. He also, you might notice, has a third eye in his forehead. This means that he is all-seeing. So he's all about purification. So this is Red Fudo, and you can see his, uh, his attendants here. Here's some other depictions of Red Fudo here, so you can see uh, how he looks. And this is kind of a closer image of the one we just saw, so you can better see his third eye and the rope and the sword, of course. This is a Ho'odo, or Phoenix Hall. This is a temple of light. This is the main temple of the Yodon Monastery. 
It was originally a country palace for the Fujiwara clan. It was in the style of the Shinden Zukuri, which was kind of the style of the Japanese nobility's residences. Its main apartment, called Shinden or bedchamber, faced south to bring in sunlight and opened on the pond of a beautiful garden. It aims to bring landscape into the living area. This is based on the Pure Land Buddhism. The hall was built in the center island of a pond as if floating in the pool of paradise. The Ho'odo, or Phoenix Hall, and the Jodo style garden that surround the hall was constructed based on a verse in the Meditation Sutra that says, if you want to be born in the Western paradise, you have to place a five meter statue in a pond and you should watch it. So that is what's occurring. We have two golden phoenix statues that adorn the roof of the Ho'odo, hence the name Phoenix Hall. Here you see a closer image so you can see that this is again built in kind of the middle of the pond. You've got the phoenix here on the top. There's a close-up of the golden phoenix there at the roof line. The other reason that this might be called the Phoenix Hall is because of the layout of the entire building. So this is the layout of the building. As you can see, it is similar to a Phoenix landing. So the idea is that the whole building is symbolic of a Phoenix landing in the pond. So there is dual meaning for the Phoenix name here. The two golden phoenixes on the roof and the layout of the building entirely. So the Amida Hall of the Ho'odo faces east towards the Uji River. This allows the patron to look towards the statue of the Amida Buddha and look west towards the western paradise. Now in the center of the hall there is a golden statue right here. So this is in the center of uh, the center hall. This is a golden statue of the seated Amida Miyore Buddha. It's nine foot tall, give you an idea of uh, the scale the Buddha itself is. And behind the Buddha, so this is kind of surrounding, you actually, behind and around, we've got these paintings. These paintings are describing the scenery of paradise. So these are describing, so the Buddha itself is surrounded by scenes of paradise. Behind the statue is this large gilt uh, mandorla. A mandorla is a full body halo. So you can see that in both of these images here. This is the mandorla surrounded by the Buddha, who is of course seated on a lotus blossom. So the mandorla is a symbol that emphasizes the union of opposites such as heaven and earth. It also functionally also helps tie the access to a storage room behind. Here's a close-up of one of those images of a paradise that you see surrounding the Buddha. You can see that they are damaged, but uh, you can see some of the wonderful landscapes regardless. Chinese is the official language of scholarship in J Korea as well as in Japan for a time, and in some areas remained so until the 19th century. For poetry, they would use Japanese, but the official language, uh, official documents would be Chinese. So they created syllabaries, systems of writing which a sign stands for a syllable of Japanese and used Chinese brushstrokes to create Japanese characters. So they had a formal angular script for official documents, but a graceful cursive script for personal and literary use. Courtly women typically would become accomplished calligraphers in Japanese. Now we're in the Kamakura period. This is night attack on the Sanjo Palace. There's also some great videos on canvas about this piece in particular. This is a scene from the novel Heiji Monogatari. It's an action-packed novel from 1220. It shows the spirit of the Kamakura warrior society. This itself is a 25 and a half foot long scroll. 
the action moves from right to left and we're seeing right here the flames destroying the palace complex. This is considered to be an otoko-i, which means men's painting. We also see it's a bird's eye view of action. Again, moves right to left. It has written introduction and conclusion with much of the inside or the interior being visual descriptions. The incident that is depicted here in the Sanjo Palace is part of the Heiji insurrection of 1159 to 60. This is a short war and there's some other famous conflicts before and after that punctuate this uh, very brutal time. Afterwards in 1192 we have the establishment of the Kamakura Shogunate. So this is actually once part of a much larger set that pictorialized the entire Heiji incident along with other scrolls. Unfortunately, this is the main one that has survived. They celebrate Japan's change from a realm controlled by a royal court to one ruled by the samurai. So the Sandro Palace was a home of former Emperor Go Shirakawa, known for a career as uh, one of the longest lived of the retired royals. He had recently abdicated in favor of his son, Emperor Nijo. The two emperors backed vying sides of the Fujiwara clan, who was a very conspiratorial family, and they were oftentimes very influential in choosing a succession of emperors. One member of this clan, Fujiwara no Noboyori, plotted against everyone. There's also the Tiara and the Minamoto clans also involved in these disputes. So this night attack was part of Fujiwara no Nobayori's bid to se seize power by abducting both the emperor and the retired emperor. So retired emperor and his son. This was backed by Minamoto no Yoshitomo, head of the clan. So Nobayori saw an opportunity when the head of the Tiara clan, who supported Emperor Nijo, left Kyoto on pilgrimage. So uh, one of the current emperor's biggest supporters left the area, and so he saw his time to act. So we also see the seizing of the retired emperor as well, because remember he was a very important, influential figure in and of himself. We see several things happening, and we'll see these same figures uh, over and over because this is a sequential series of events. So we'll see like an ox carriage. That's a little easier to see sometimes in all this, and we'll see it multiple times. Let's. This is a bigger image of what we're seeing in this entire scroll. Again, the entire scroll, quite long. And so we've got, again, the initial in the end so this talks about the uh what's happening and then we've got the scene itself so we've got kind of the initial battle and then we've got the palace going up in flames and then we've got the fleeing and we see these carts and so you can kind of keep track of some of it just by looking at some of these carts and seeing how they these ox carts so we see a minamoto yoshitomo he is uh, on horseback and is in red armor and a horned helmet. We see him appearing twice in the scroll. Once behind the carriage as it crashes into the veranda, brandishing a bow and arrow, and then behind it in the departing crowd. Here's some close-ups so we can kind of see. This is quite a brutal event, and you can actually see a lot of the brutality. You've got some uh, beheadings and stabbings and and they go into quite uh, quite gory detail when you look at the details into this. Here uh, we see women who are trying to uh, escape. You see the blood surrounding them. Very brutal aspects. Here's that ox cart again. Here's another detail again of being about to be stabbed with a, a samurai blade. Here is someone that unfortunately is deceased. So the remainder of the Heiji Rebellion appeared on the other scrolls in this set. So we have, of course, the kidnapping of Emperor Nijo, the slaughter of another noble household. We have 
Nobuyori forcing Nijo to appoint him chancellor. We have Tiara Kiyomori's return to decimate the schemers. And finally, Kiyomori's mistake, where he banished rather than executed several of Minamoto's sons. So Minamoto no Yoritomo and his brother Yoshitsune would return years later to destroy the Chara clan in the Genpei War and found the first of four military governments of the shogunate that ruled Japan from 1192 until 1867. Emperors and nobles remained in Kyoto, but were politically powerless. The feudal culture eventually came to an end in 1868 at the hands of other samurai clans. So this is a good time to talk about the samurai. The samurai are members of a powerful military caste in feudal Japan. They began as provincial warriors before rising to power, as we just talked about. They are servants of the demyos, or great lords. The samurai backed up the authority of the shogun and gave him power over the mikado, or emperor. The samurai would dominate Japanese government and society until the Meiji Restoration of 1868, which led to the abolition of this feudal system. So there's the traditional samurai code of honor, discipline, and morality, known as Bushido, or the way of the warrior. It was a basic code of conduct for much of Japanese society. All right, so just to kind of review some of these terms, we've got the shogun. So he is the head guy, uh, almost a uh, king. We've got the demyo, kind of a lord, and then we have a samurai, kind of the equivalent of a knight in that medieval European system. So we've got the shogun, demyo, and samurai in that order. So during the Heian period, 1794 to 1185, the samurai were armed supporters of wealthy landowners. So these are oftentimes people who were kind of shut out of power by the powerful Fujiwara clan. Samurai roughly translates into those who serve. So again, the Genpei War, 1180 to 1185, pitted the Tiara and the Minamoto clans against each other for a struggle of control. The Minamoto Yoshitsune led his clan to victory against the Tiara near the village of Dano Nura. So Minamoto Yoritomo actually drove his half-brother Yoshitsune into exile and established the center of government at Kamakura. So it's the Kamakura shogunate that really shifted the real political power in Japan to the samurai. So this is coming at a time when Zen Buddhism is also very popular and it dovetails with it. So Zen Buddhism holds a lot of appeal for the samurai. It's all about austere and simple rituals, salvation, comes from within, and it really connects with the samurai's own code of behavior. So a man's honor was said to reside in his sword with the samurai. The craftsmanship of swords became exquisite with carefully hammered blades, gold and silver inlay, and shark skin hand grips. So the strain of defeating two Mongol invasions at the end of the 13th century weakened the Kamakura shogunate, uh, fell into rebellion, and we have the Ashikaga shogunate, centered in Kyoto, beginning around 1336. Japan is in a near constant state of conflict. After this time, we have a divisive Onin War from 1467 to 77. And eventually, we have um, a lack of strong central authority local lords and samurai stepping into greater extent to maintain law and order. The Sengoku Jodai actually unifies Japan under Tokugawa Ieyasu. This is a time period that ushers in peace and prosperity for 250 years. So the shogun was a military dictator of Japan from the period of 1185 to 1868, with a few exceptions. 
if we're talking about the shoguns and the samurai, we need to talk about their outfits, their armor. So here is a photograph showing some of this armor on an individual. And this is actually one that we have at the museum. It dates to around 1550. And the symbol on it, I've been told, is meant to represent a very important clan. Obviously, the ribbon work has been replaced. This is not original ribbon work that we see there. So these are lacquer plates. So it's built up from many layers of lacquer. We've talked about that. This makes it a very lightweight material, so not as heavy as those thick metal pieces that we see in the West. So this is the chainmail for the arms. So this has been taken off the silk underneath has deteriorated, so it's just these pieces. So it's, you can see this intricate layer of chainmail, but then we have these other pieces sewn in, and these actually help deflect the sword. So especially these right here, these are meant to actually deflect the sword and to uh, kind of push the sword away from the body. So we have these protections. We can see where the bend of the arm is and there's the elbow protection for the elbow there so this is an image when we had it displayed at one point so this is the helmet that goes with it there's actually a nose piece that has been missing but we see the rest of the helmet we have a nice protection for the back of the neck as well as some for the chin and throat area it is meant to really protect the wearer. Again, as lightly as possible, it is a lacquered form.